and I'm going to take you away from your comfort zone or from your familiar surroundings for a little while. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a time that I spend every year if I can uh, when I leave Arizona where I live and travel on the other side of the world to the foothills of the Himalayas to teach Tibetan monks cosmology. And I'm going to give you a little travelogue about that and give you a flavor for what that's like, East meets West. Monk Gravity is the actual title. So let's get started. When you land in New Delhi and you're in this amazing sea of people, 16 million strong, wandering around trying to get your orientation, you know you're in another world. It's an amazing place where life is lived on the streets, there are extremes of wealth and poverty, incredible food, incredible sensory assault almost by everything that's around you. Um, commerce played out on the streets, large and small. It's an amazing place, modern India. Um, the vitality of the youth, because most of India is young, under 18. And beautiful sounds, sights, smells. You won't get the full sensory experience in this talk, but I'll try and give you it indirectly at least. Um, when you try and go to the northern part of India, small rural areas, you learn that driving in India is not quite the same as driving in the West. Breakneck speed, overtaking on bends, people just clearing the car as you whiz by and multiply that minute by five or six hours and it's quite a breathtaking experience. It's amazing people don't die. Some do, I suppose, but not too many given how they drive. And at the end of all that, you're in the Himalayas, here seen shrouded in mist, rice paddies in the valleys turning into arboreal preserves and tea plantations at the higher elevations. Uh, this is the place where the Dalai Lama lives. This is Dharamsala, small hill town in India, home to the highest altitude cricket ground in the world. It's about 7,000 feet up. And here, seen through Tibetan prayer flags, is the cliff town of Dharamsala the home in exile of the Dalai Lama and many Tibetans, population about 50% Tibetan, 50% Indian. Um, a place, again, of mystery and magic, all sorts of sights you see walking around the town. Many temples, heavy Buddhist influence, of course, throughout, richly decorated, a sensory assault again from the smells of the incense and the sounds of their music playing out. You can get up early in the morning and see the monks debating in the grounds of the monasteries, their formal method of learning, which I got to utilize in my teaching of the monks and nuns. They're gentle people, they're curious, they're very interested in science, even though it's not a big part of their formal education. And they can be fierce at times. This man, Geshe Lakdor, is actually the head of the Tibetan library and works. Uh, he was the Dalai Lama's personal translator and the person who traveled with him for 20 years in the West, an erudite man and sort of head of the program that I taught in. The monks don't take themselves too seriously, encouraging me not to take myself too seriously as I teach them about the universe we live in. Uh, occasionally we do a little role playing. It's always good when Einstein pays a visit, which pretty much happens every time I teach there. And this is Bryce Johnson. He's the young environmental scientist who gave me a call out of the blue about 10 years ago and said, how'd you like to teach the Dalai Lama's monks astronomy and cosmology? And I'd never been there. I had no idea what program he was talking about, but it's not a question you ruminate over. I said yes, and then figured out how it would work, how I'd get away for three or four weeks and fit it into my academic life and teaching schedule. Um, and he's the young organizer of this conference and series of workshops, which over more than a decade has trained hundreds of monks and more late, latterly nuns uh, of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition in science of all kinds, not just astronomy and cosmology, but biology, mathematics, and physics. The first time I went, I went with my son, Paul. He was 17. It was an amazing experience for him, for both of us, really. And I knew at the time that there was a book in all of this. And so based actually on my first trip there when it was all fresh and new, I, I wrote a book and it's called Humble Before the Void. As a backdrop to teaching science to a religious order, which is what the Buddhist monks are, we have this statistics from the United States. 
um, indicating some lack of credibility of modern scientific theories with the American population. Uh, these are disconcerting numbers for any educator. About half of the American public don't think the Big Bang happened, almost half don't believe in evolution or doubt that the Earth is billions of years old, and a similar percentage don't think that the planet is actually warming. So we have a science literacy crisis in the United States. It's maybe not as severe in Europe, but it's significant worldwide. And that's an issue. More people need to learn about science. In the terms of religion and science, fields that are occasionally seem to be at odds with each other, this quote from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is a striking quote. If science proves some belief of Buddhism wrong, then Buddhism will have to change. And I would challenge you to imagine how many of the world's great religions would be able to say this about their relationship with evidence and science. So I had to reorganize my course. Essentially, I threw out all the ways I'd been teaching before because I knew this was an opportunity to approach my subject fresh. And I just as an organizational tool chose to organize it along a wheel of life in eight parts. And we walked through the material of astronomy, getting familiar with the universe. We started by talking about how scientists learn anything, how we learn about the universe, and about the fact that in the history of astronomy in particular, there have only been a couple of phases, naked eye astronomy, all the way through the dawn of time and the beginning of humans until 1600, and then the invention of the telescope, and a long march of several centuries of building bigger and bigger telescopes. The next revolution in seeing the universe is in the 20th century when techniques of radio and x-ray and microwaves open up the electromagnetic spectrum. That's a factor of a trillion in wavelength compared to the range that the eye can see. And the most recent revolution in physics and how to see the universe is just a few years old. It's the detection of gravitational waves, first time in 2016. And now we can see the universe with gravity eyes. Seeing the universe involves imagination and thought, the idea of combining things to produce an unexpected outcome. Art and science are separated in our learning and siloed in universities and schools, and that's a shame because the thought process that a creative scientist and an artist go through are very similar. In this brilliant example, Picasso has taken two parts of a rusted bike and combined them to make something brand new and recognizable. That's brilliant. That's the creative process. And scientists try at their best to do the same thing. Scientists try to imagine orbits. Newton here on the left, imagining a cannonball fired from a high mountain fast enough that the earth dropped away at the same rate that the cannonball fell. And he's visualizing an orbit 350 years before we had the technology to launch something into orbit. More recently, astronomers and artists here in these diagrams and paintings are imagining other worlds. And now we know that there are billions of habitable worlds, not just in our galaxy, but in all the galaxies beyond. The monks like to learn through debate. And debate for monks is not just a formal, sterile process. It's a dynamic, very active process. In this little video, we see the debate grounds of one of the great monasteries of Southern India, where thousands of monks gather and do competitions throughout a week to debate various subjects, the theosophy, theology, philosophy, and science too. We explored space, and space, of course, is almost unimaginably big, so we had to make models. I talked about grains of sand as a way of contemplating the large numbers of the universe, and also hidden worlds, because as Blake said, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, each grain of sand is a unique world. We got to grips with big numbers by imagining how many grains of sand would fit inside a square centimeter, and then projecting that out to a sand mandala, one of the evanescent forms of art that Tibetans and Buddhists make and then destroy after they've made the exquisite patterns. So the way of calculating this was a way of them getting to terms with numbers like hundreds of millions or even billions of experiencing those numbers in their gut rather than just with a calculator or as a number. The cosmos contains inestimable numbers too. This is a tiny thumbnail shot 
of the universe seen through almost to the Big Bang itself. This region of space is about the head of a pin held at arm's length, a tiny fraction of the sky, yet every fuzzy patch of light is a galaxy, distant system of stars. Projecting across the sky, the universe contains a hundred billion galaxy, each of them with hundreds of billions of stars. This is the cosmos as we had to understand it by working our way through larger and larger numbers. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.